take our Bibles this morning and go to Matthew chapter 28. <coughs> Matthew chapter 28. <coughs> so Matthew chapter 28, and we will be in verses 17 through 20. Excuse me. So Matthew chapter 28, verse 17 through 20, the Bible says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Again, Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us to be gathered together. Father, we ask that you bless the children in junior church, Lord. Open up their hearts and minds to the teaching of your word. I pray that their hearts would be drawn to Jesus, that they would learn that he's the best friend that they can have. I pray, Father, you would continue to help us to build our life upon Jesus Christ, upon Uh, the truth of your word. I pray, Father, that our hearts would always stay tender, uh, Lord, to you, to the things that you have given us through your word and by the Holy Spirit. I pray that our ears would continue to be open and sensitive to your voice as you speak to us on a day-to-day basis. And we do thank you, Father, for the relationship that we have with you because of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have the privilege to come to you through prayer Lord, to spend time with you, uh, whether it's seeking you uh, for a need, whether it's just praising you for who you are, we thank you for the open relationship that we have with you, that the veil was torn uh, in from top to bottom, it was torn in twain so that we could enter into the Holy of Holies because the blood of Jesus Christ had been shed for the remission of sin, it was accepted uh, in your sight as the atoning, uh, the atonement for all sin, and we thank you, Father, for, again, just the privilege to be able to tell others about Jesus. Thank you, Father, again, for your word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So help us, Lord, not to take for granted the things you've given us, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I do want to talk to us about going into all the world. It is kind of a missions theme this morning. You could probably tell uh, by the songs that we have sung, the focus being Jesus Christ. I love that song, The Old Rugged Cross, because it reminds us what our faith is built upon. It's built upon Jesus Christ. It's not built upon man's opinion. It's not built upon a church, but it's built upon our Savior and our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke, in Acts chapter 1, as he was writing to Theophilus, a ruler in the day, he says in Acts chapter 1, Verses 1 through 3, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus both began uh, to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Forty days after His resurrection he spent among 500 eyewitnesses along with the apostles, the disciples. He spent time with them, telling them what he wanted them to do. He had been teaching them all the way up to the cross, after the cross, after the burial, after the resurrection, after his ascension the first time to present his blood on the altar that is before God in heaven. He comes back and spends 40 days with his disciples, those that he would send out with the gospel. I'm glad that we walk by faith. The Bible tells us to walk by faith. Without faith, no one can be saved because it's faith in Jesus Christ. It's faith in his shed blood. It is his blood that was shed that paid the penalty for our sin. And it's also faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He didn't just die. He wasn't just buried but he rose again. 
He is alive, and that's why we're looking for the blessed hope. Never forget who you're going to see when you're caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord. You're going to see your Savior face to face. Your faith is going to become sight on that day. We walk by faith, not by sight now, but our faith will become sight when we see Him face to face. And as we think about the Lord's command here, it wasn't just to His disciples on this day, but it was to all of those that would be saved going forward that we would share the gospel. We would tell others about Jesus Christ. We would tell others that they have a hope in this world even when it seems to them they have no hope. Remember in John 17, Jesus stops at the temple to pray before going over the book Kidron, before going to the Garden of Gethsemane, before praying and praying with great drops of blood, before Judas would lead the mob to the garden to take him, he stopped at the temple to pray. And as he was spending time at the temple praying, he said to the Father that those that will believe on him later through the preaching of the disciples, that he would keep them, that he would build them up and he would help them to accomplish his will. He prayed for you on that night. He prayed for everybody that will be saved. Now, I'll tell you just as a preface, it is, it's a sad thing that not everybody will receive the truth of the gospel, that not everybody will receive Christ as their Savior. The Lord knows who will and will not, but He gives all of us an opportunity to share that truth, the truth that has changed your life. And I hope that your life has been changed by Jesus Christ. I hope that you know Christ is your Savior. You know that heaven is your home and there's something on the inside that just brings a smile to your face because it is the Lord Jesus Christ that lives within us. Again, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Never forget that. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by what? I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that helps us to live the life that we're living, but it also helps us to share our testimony, to share our faith with others. Now, there are some places in this world I would love to visit. I would love to go to Italy. I would love to go, you know, to Scotland and Ireland and, and different places that I'll probably never get to go. But God has called some to go into the world in other countries to take the gospel. Not for a vacation, but to take the gospel and to help lives be changed by the power of Jesus Christ when they received that message. Now, we may not go into a different world, but we have a different world right where we're living. I remember as a young man uh, living in the world of Mississippi, all right? If you know where Mississippi is at, it's down at the bottom. I mean, it's, it's one of the poorest states, but it was what was home for me for, for 18 years. And I just remember when I was given the opportunity to leave that, I, was, I was really thought I was leaving the world, the country that I was a part of, to go somewhere I didn't know even where it was at on the map to the state of Wisconsin. But as God led me there, he changed my life. He brought me to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He allowed me to be a part of a church that taught the truth of God's word, that led people to Christ, and gave people an opportunity to serve the Lord. Many people would go from that church to the mission field. Some would just go off to other churches to be a pastor or, or whatever. But God always gives us an opportunity to serve him in some capacity. And when we serve the Lord, it is to be out of a heart of love, out of a heart of genuineness, out of a heart of devotion to the Lord. Just remember that your faith, and I hope it is, it's built and based upon Jesus Christ, not a man, not a church, but the Lord Jesus Christ who loved you, died for you, paid for your sin, rose again, and lives within you. 
But God does want us to be a part of his mission program the best that we can. And this morning, Jesus says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You already know that these disciples did just that on one day. Now, as they hear this, they're probably wondering, how can we go into all the world? He's telling us to go into all the world. But is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything that God cannot do for you and with you? Because on the day of Pentecost, God made sure that there were thousands of Jews from all over the world that had come to Jerusalem for the feast, for the celebration, and for the day of Pentecost. And when they heard Peter preaching, 3,000 are saved. 3,000 put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And those 3,000 would spend some time there in Jerusalem, but then they would slowly disperse and go back to where they were from. Because you remember, Philip, he ends up meeting an Ethiopian eunuch who was just in Jerusalem for the feast because he was a proselyte. He had, he had come to know Jehovah as the true living God, and there he came to worship. And Peter, I'm sorry, Philip goes to him because the Holy Spirit told him to. The Holy T Spirit told him to go down into Gaza, go to a desert place, and it was there that Philip joins up, joins up with this Ethiopian eunuch who just happens to be reading in the book of Isaiah. What a coincidence. Aren't you glad that there are so many coincidences in life? You realize it was a coincidence the day that someone told you about Jesus Christ, the day that you accepted Christ as your Savior. What a wonderful coincidence, right? I'm being facetious. It's not a coincidence. God orchestrates the meeting of people. And there are people in our lives that God has brought into our lives so that we could minister to them. We could tell them about the hope that lies within us. We could tell them about the power of God in us that helps us to choose to do what's right or to deny evil and to choose to do what is right. It is by God's power that we can live the Christian life that he's called us to live. But he has given us an opportunity to tell others about what Jesus has done for you. I mean, you know what it's like when, you know, when anything good happens into you, in your life, you keep it to yourself, right? I mean, anything, anything good that happens, well, I can't tell anybody because I don't want anyone else to be happy, right? No, you want to be. Uh, you want, you're happy. You want others to be happy as well. I mean, just, uh, I, I don't keep too much from my wife, but one thing I did keep from, him, from her was the naming of my fourth son. Because we, we, we always talked about the naming of our kids. But this particular time, we're like, you know what? We're going to wait. We're not even going to come up with a name until we set eyes upon him. And she said, honey, you're going to be the one to come up with that name. I was like, man, what a privilege. Wow, I get to do something. And I just remember that day. My friend of mine called me on the phone. I'm, I'm just happy telling him, yeah, he's born, yeah. No, I'm excited. And, and he asked, well, what's his name? I said, his name is, and my wife, she's like, because she I hadn't told her either. She's like waiting. You know, I, you know, I feel bad, but hey, my friend asked, so you know what? I tell him the name. And I just remember saying, Matthew Joshua. And I was so happy just to even say the name. There's things in your life that brings you happiness and joy, and you want to share it with other people. Think about your relationship with Christ. Think about the greatest gift that you and I have ever received, the Lord Jesus Christ. That should still be making us happy. Now, you know, with children, you're not happy all the time. There are some times where you got to kind of be stern and get on to them, right? And there's days that you're happy because they cleaned up their room, they picked up their socks, all that stuff, right? But again... Think about the Lord Jesus Christ. What has he done for you that you don't want other people to know? 
Now, when you think about the worship of the disciples, notice what it says in verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. They go up to this mount and they see the Lord. They've already seen him a couple of times, but they see him again and they just worship him because he's worthy of our worship. His worship goes into all the world. You realize Jesus is worshiped all around the world by believers, by Christians, by those who have put their faith and trust in his blood and in his resurrection. Again, what, you know, do this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to look at verses 1 through 4. Because this is the plan of salvation. This is the gospel. This is what brings us joy knowing that we've put our faith and trust in this, that we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that Christ lives within us and he has prepared a place for us. And one day our faith is going to become sight when we see him face to face. Before I even read this, I, my hope and my prayer is that everybody in the sound of my voice knows Christ is their Savior, and you're looking forward to seeing him. Now, there's some people we don't look forward to seeing. There's relatives we don't look forward to seeing. You know, we go to family reunions, and you might be thinking, man, I hope they're not there. I hope they don't recognize me. I hope they don't, you know, you go to work, wherever. There's people that you kind of, you know, avoid, and if you see them, you know, you turn the other way, and I hope they didn't see me. You know what? In heaven, we're not going to be able to hide from anybody everyone's going to see you that's there, right? But it is something exciting when you know you're going to see your Savior face to face. One day you get to see the one that you have been believing in by faith, the one you've been hoping every day he will help you through the day, he will give you the wisdom, the protection, whatever it is you need. You've been hoping and praying and you've been seeing him work in your life. The Bible says in verse uh, one of chapter 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Keep standing in the truth of the gospel. Doesn't matter what the world says. Doesn't matter what a man says. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If you hear me start teaching something that's not from the Bible, stop listening and start questioning. Because I do my best to just say what the Bible says says, all right, because it is about your faith is to be standing in God, in Jesus Christ. Can people fail you? Has anybody ever failed you? Yeah. I failed people, people have failed me, but Jesus never fails, and that's what our faith is in. So keep standing in Jesus Christ, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Right? Our faith is based upon what God has said in his word. What are you trusting in for salvation? I hope it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If somebody asks you, how do I know I can be saved? Please don't say, well, my pastor says. Don't say that. God says, right? Know how to explain it to somebody. And the best way to explain it is what he's done for you. What did he do for you? Where were you at in your life when you put your faith in Jesus, what was going on? The greatest testimony is your testimony, not somebody else's. Now, there's a, lot, there's a lot of good testimonies. I love hearing how people have gotten saved from drunkenness, have gotten saved from drugs and, you know, just a hard life. But I also like hearing the testimonies of the ones that grew up in church and decided they were going to be faithful to God and not go off into the world. Everybody has a wonderful testimony, and your testimony is the greatest because it's your testimony that you get to share with somebody else because how else is someone going to know to trust Jesus? Why do I need to trust Jesus? Do you realize not a single person 
There's not a single person in the world that doesn't know they're a sinner. They know they, know they do bad things, right? They need to know why they need to trust Jesus Christ. And like I'm, and like I'm kind of talking about this morning about missions, I can't talk to somebody in Italy, but there's missionaries there. We have some missionary, we have a missionary that's, that's in uh, Ireland, one that's in Israel. Do you realize that even though Israel is God's chosen people, there's so many that are lost and don't know Christ as their Savior? And, and to the Christian, reading their Bible, you might think, how is that? How can God's chosen people not know him? Because they chose not to. And they need to know about their Messiah. They need to know about their Savior, Jesus Christ. But not only the worship, they came and worshipped him. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. The disciples, they worshipped in the upper room there at the, after the resurrection. Thomas answered, said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, because uh, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Remember Thomas? He wouldn't believe unless he saw. You realize God's not afraid to show somebody what they need to see in order for them to believe? Because think about this. I grew up going to church. As far back as I can remember, I went to church. Doesn't mean I was saved. I heard the Bible stories. But it wasn't until later on in life, through my teenage years, and when I got in my early 20s, I realized I need the Lord. He showed me I needed him. God's not afraid to show people that they need him. He's not afraid to come and dispel the doubt that's in somebody's heart. We talked about this in Sunday school, but this verse talks about Thomas. He doubted. He doubted the resurrection of Christ, but he believed in the Lord because he walked with the Lord. And the Lord comes to him and says, hey, go ahead, thrust your fist in my side. Touch the, touch the print of the nails that were in my, my hands. And Thomas wouldn't. When you, when you read all that account, he just worshiped the Lord. He, he didn't even, sometimes we put our feet in our mouth. We say things we shouldn't. But the Lord still wants to show us to take away the doubt, to take away the fear. And Thomas didn't do what he said he would do. He just said, my God and my Lord. That proved that he knew the Lord is his Savior. He just had some doubt and fear that God wanted to reassure him, peace be still. Everything's fine. I have risen. And man, Thomas goes on to live his life for the Lord. And because of that, because they worshipped him, and you can't, you can't help but to worship God without having some wonder towards him. Some wonder towards him because he's alive. Why do we sing songs? Why do we sing songs about the old rugged cross? Why do we sing songs about the resurrection? Because he's alive. I mean, it, it draws our heart to the Lord. The Bible says in Matthew 28, verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. These are the ladies that had gone to the tomb early. They find it empty. They're running back to tell the disciples. He says, all hell, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Now, he's worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. God is worthy of our worship because of what he's done for us. Now, you may, you may not be able to, you, to you, you may not be able to sing. Sometimes I wish I could record myself, not, my, not audio, but just video, record myself in the choir and send it back to my pastor. Because I, you know, I still can't sing. I just kind of blend in. But I remember one time, you know, pastor, let me be in the choir. He's like, no way. You can't sing. And rightfully so, I, I, I can't sing, and boy, I couldn't sing then because uh, they had me and my wife try to, uh, for a Christmas play, we were, we were Mary and Joseph when we were supposed to have a singing part, <laughs> and during practice, all eyes are on us, 
and we had to, I forget what even the song was, but we had to sing, and I think I got two unrecognizable notes out, and the pastor's like, quit, quit, you guys are not singing. It was more so me. My wife can sing, but uh, I cannot sing. But there's times, you know, where I just want to, you know, send a video back, you know, just so he can see me in the choir. He doesn't have to hear me, but just see me, you know, up there among the, you know, the choir. Anyway, why I said all that, I don't know. But I do want you to think about this. Worshiping God, it's from the heart, right? It's from the heart. Why do you sing to the Lord? Because of what he's done. Why do you read your Bible? Because of what he's done. Why do you do anything for the Lord? It's because of what he's done for you. He is alive and he is worthy because everything he's done has been truth. Remember Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. In John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He is truth. Aren't you glad that there's only one way to heaven? I mean, it's bad enough that when you go on vacation or you take a trip out of state and you got to pull up your Google Maps, you got to you got to pull up, you know, uh, you know, your iPhone map, all this stuff, you know, map it out, right? And, and you don't have to raise your hand or shake, but how many of you don't listen to the voice on the GPS? Because you know a different way, right? The GPS takes you a certain way, right? You're, oh, I know a shortcut. And you try to turn and, and make a U-turn, make a U-turn. You just ignore it and you just keep going, right? Because you know the direction you want to go. But aren't you glad that you don't have to worry about, am I on the right path? Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to be worried about being on the right path. But once you know Christ is your Savior, he's the one that guides you, leads you. He's the one that says, keep your eyes on me and just keep following me because you know that Jesus Christ is true. And salvation through Christ is true. And that's, again, that's why we have missionaries that go off into different countries because not everybody can. But God raises up those that will go off into those mission fields, go off into the different countries, and we get to be a part of that. We get to support them, help them along the way. And, I mean, just think about it. I know that sometimes it's hard to trust people. It's hard to trust people. Someone may have the idea, well, I don't know what they're going to do with the money. Well, you don't. But you have to trust that they're going to use it the way that they're supposed to use it. I'll be honest because I, I've been in the ministry long enough. Uh, I've been on uh, the deacon board. I've, I've had to, you know, listen to, okay, we got to drop this missionary because of this reason and that reason, right? The church does the best it can to keep up with missionaries to make sure they're still doctrinally sound. And we've even had missionaries, not in this church, but my home church, we had missionaries we had to drop because they weren't doctrinally sound anymore. Uh, they were starting to teach heresy, things that were against the truth of God's word, right? And there were some as well that, you know, misused funds. And you know what? We gave them an opportunity to make things right. And if they did, we dropped them and we had to drop them. I bring that up because I know finances are a big struggle for people, especially when you're giving it to something that you don't know, how is it going to be handled, all right? But that doesn't mean that we don't obey what God wants us to do. It doesn't mean that we don't follow the heart of God. And it's also important that some will, okay, they're okay with supporting missionaries, letting missionaries go out and, and spread the gospel and tell other people about Jesus and they don't tell anybody right where they live. So we all have a part to play in God's plan of salvation because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. People have to hear that, you know what, there's a God in heaven that loves them. There's a God in heaven that can give them victory over their struggles, whatever they're struggling, whether it's a, a mental struggle 
a physical struggle, a spiritual struggle. Whatever it is, Jesus has given the victory because he's alive. That's why in Sunday school this morning we're talking about it's not good enough that Jesus died and was buried, but that he rose again. That's important. The foundation of our faith is based on his death, burial, and resurrection. And that is the gospel. That is what gives people power to say no to sin. It is what helps break the chains that people have in their lives. The witness of the disciples, look at verse 18 and verse 20. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He just states it up front. He has all power. Therefore, he tells the disciples he wants them to do something. Has God ever asked you to do something that you felt like you couldn't do? That maybe you even dragged your feet on doing it because you were looking at your inability to do it? Maybe you were looking at your, your talents going, well, none of the things I know to do and how to do matches up to what God wants me to do. Because who gets the glory if we do it in our own strength, our own wisdom, our own power? We do. Do you know why I do not believe Samson looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger? I don't believe Samson in Scripture was this big, you know, man, just muscular. Because who would get the glory for him carrying gates of a city on his shoulders off? Who would get the glory for all the things he did? He would. Because, well, yeah, you know, look at him. You know, he's just strong. I mean, look at him. He's, he's built like an ox. And look at he can He can bench press 800 pounds, you know, all the things. I believe he was just an ordinary guy because the Bible says when the, when the Spirit of God came upon him, then he was able to do those things. See, God asks us to do things at different times in our life, and you may and may not have the ability to do it, but God wants us to rely upon him. He wants us to go to him for the resource. What, teaching Sunday school, right? Whatever it may be, teaching Sunday school, raising kids. You know, there's not a perfect parent, but we all try to do our best and try to raise our kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's not a perfect spouse, but we try our best. We try to, we try to love the other spouse the way that we want to be loved. We, we try to raise our kids with the love and affection, the direction that they need, right? All at the same time, Lord, help me to do what I'm supposed to do. Help me to fulfill these roles. Missionaries go out and they're relying upon the Lord to give them the ability to tell people in these foreign lands about Christ. We're, you know, you're talking to, you know, co-workers or family members or friends about the Lord. You know, you're asking God, Lord, help me to know what to say. Help me know how to start the conversation. Lord, would you lead the conversation so, you know, it gives me an opportunity to say something. And maybe the conversation started off with the person saying, man, God's so rotten. Would the cat get your tongue and you not say anything? He's like, oh, they just said God's bad. No, that's when you say, God's actually pretty good, let me tell you, right? Gives us an opportunity. God's power in our life because he has all power. The Bible says in John 16, 33, these things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's Jesus speaking. If Jesus has overcome the world, he gives us the power to overcome the world as well. Those, uh, those resistance in our life, those oppositions. Listen, who doesn't want someone to hear the good news about Jesus Christ? Who is it that doesn't want someone to hear, hey, you may have been mistreated by people, but there's someone who will never mistreat you, right? The devil wants to keep people from hearing the truth, wants to keep people from hearing that, hey, there's hope in your creator. There's hope in the one that knows you better than anybody else. There's hope in the one that knows what is affecting your heart that nobody else knows, because to be honest, we don't tell everybody what's bothering us, what we're struggling with. But God knows and God wants to fix it. 
God is the answer, and he wants to turn someone's life right side up because he has the power to do that. But he also gives these disciples the ability to do what he wants them to do. Verse 20, he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the world. Aren't you glad that Jesus is with you all the time, even unto the end of the world? There's never a time he's not with you. Even when you don't feel like he's with you, he's with you. And believe me, there's been times in my life where I didn't feel his presence. I'm like, my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. I just feel like, you know, I'm just not reaching God. I feel like God's not hearing me. I feel like God's ignoring me. And the truth is, he's not. The problem is in here. The problem is in us. God has given us exactly what we need his presence in our life, and we have to walk by faith, believing that his presence is in our life, and having that desire, his presence would be in somebody else's life that desperately needs it. You know, again, in Sunday school, we're going through a series entitled For the Faith, and we're talking about our faith, and we're starting at the foundation, the foundation being the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and this morning we talked about is there anyone who cannot be saved? Now, God's all-knowing, and God knows who will and will not trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. But is there anyone who cannot be saved? Is there anyone Jesus didn't die for? No, he died for everybody. His blood was shed for the remission of sin, right? He paid the penalty for sin. Anyone can get saved. Unfortunately, not everybody will. But I'm glad for those who do. Is there someone who is such a bad sinner they cannot get saved? No. We even talked about one. I won't, I won't name his name now, but there are many people in the history of humans that are just you know, the things that they do. They deserve death. And in the human mind, they deserve to burn in hell. But in God's heart, He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance, right? And I'm glad for those who have lived a hard life, chosen to do heinous crimes, can still get saved and have their life changed because it's God's love. That is why God sent Jesus Christ for the sinner. Remember, Jesus said he came for the sinner, not the righteous, right? It's sinners that need saving, not the righteous. But again, there's not one single person who is so righteous, they don't need to be saved, right? Jesus said that because the Pharisees thought they were so religious, they didn't need saving. But they were the ones that needed saving the most. But you think about just the power of God and the power that he gives us to accomplish exactly what he wants us to do, and that is telling others about Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency or speech or of wisdom, right? Sometimes we don't know what to say. Sometimes we think, well, if I, to talk to this person, I got to be really intellectual. I got to, you know what, I need to know about cars. I'm going to read a magazine on, on how to tear cars apart and build cars back so I can start a conversation with the mechanic. That's not what God wants to do. Paul says, you know what? I came not knowing worldly wisdom, right? He says, but declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, sometimes we get hung up. I say we just in general. Christians get hung up in not knowing what to say when they do know what to say, they're just believing a lie that they don't know what to say. Because there are people in your life that you know exactly what to say. We're homeschooling, and uh, my girls, my, my wife is, is uh, doing dictation with them. She's, she's reading some scripture. And they've got to write down what she says. 
you know, got to get the spelling and all of that, you know, just listen and, and, and write it down, you know, punctuation and everything, right? And then we want them to read it back to us. And there's times where they just hesitate. It's like it's right there, but they hesitate because they don't want to say the wrong word. They wanna, don't want to pronounce it wrong. And you just see it's a human tendency to not want to say the wrong thing and to wanna, not want to mess up. That's why God's given us the ability. And again, this morning we're talking about telling people about Jesus, telling people about what he's done for me. Again, one of the, the greatest testimony, again, is your testimony. You realize I sympathize for those who fall from a ceiling and, and, and get hurt, fall off a roof and get hurt, because I've been there. I've fallen through a ceiling and, and had my left heel shattered and been laid up in the bed for five weeks and not able to go to church as a pastor and not be able to preach five weeks laid up in the hospital, laid up in the, in the bed. And it's like, I was so glad when I got back to church. I was in a wheelchair, but man, I was glad to be there. And I preached from a wheelchair with my foot sticking out. I was just happy to be back, happy to be back with God's people. I'm just saying that you know that God has allowed. How many of you believe Romans 8.28? Take your Bibles to Romans 8.28. Because somebody may be believing the lie, God can't use me because of this, because of that that's happened in my life. But Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Do you love God? He's got a purpose for what's happened in your life, good or bad. And he wants to use it to help other people. You know why God calls certain people to the mission field that have had a tragedy in their life? I don't know if this has ever happened to you, and, and I'm, I don't think I'm off topic, at least not off my message, but there are things that happen in your life that down the road, God's going to bring somebody in your life that is either currently struggling with that or has gone through it, and they can't get over it. But you've gotten over it because you found grace and peace and forgiveness in Jesus. And you're able to help them to see, you know what, I understand where you're at. I was there, and Jesus helped me. And you're able to point someone to Jesus based on what happened in your life. So just because you have bad things happen in your life, don't think that God can't use you and won't use you. He will. I mean, if he can use Paul, who was a murderer, and that's why earlier I said, is there anyone that cannot be saved? Paul was a murderer. You realize Paul was, he was killing Christians, and Jesus stopped him dead in his tracks on the road to Damascus and turned his life around, and Paul stopped killing Christians and started preaching the message that would give them life. Not too many people liked Paul. People tried to kill Paul. But listen, that's the beautiful thing about the gospel, about Jesus Christ. Anyone can be saved. Anyone's life can be helped and turned around. And anyone can find forgiveness in Jesus Christ and find the peace that they need, the grace that they need in their life all through Jesus Christ. That's why we support missionaries. That's why we teach God's word here. That's why you individually read your own Bible and you have a walk with Christ because you know it's the truth. You know it changes your life and your life has been changed. Because I, I know just about everybody in here. I don't know everything about everybody, but the, the things I do know is that God has helped you through everything in your life whatever you've had to face. He's always brought you through the storm. He's always shed his love on you. He's always given you the grace, the wisdom, the insight, whatever it is that you need. Sure, there's been seasons, just like me, where you're, you can't do anything. You're in, you're in the bed for five weeks. 
Someone else is taking care of you, and you feel miserable. But it's in those seasons that you see Christ carrying you and helping you, and we can't help but to want to see others helped through Jesus Christ. So again, going into all the world with the gospel, which is the love of God, right? God's, God's love was manifested on the cross of Calvary through Jesus Christ. 